before we do an analysis, right, let me indulge myself by looking at certain violations of the rules of engagement, and these were beautifully articulated by T.W. Kerner at Oxford University. That was sloppy. This is, I think, unarguable, at least in this paper. Okay. And how was he sloppy? Well, he's violated certain fundamental rules. The first fundamental rule is to provide details of your experimental procedure. Today, if a scientist goes into a lab, she will take a lab notebook and will jot down everything, all the details of the procedure. Why? So that a reader evaluating the results can judge for herself the reliability of the data collection and whether it is reproducible. Of course, this reproducibility is at the heart of scientific investigation. And if one doesn't provide details of how experiments were done, then of course, nothing is reproducible. So clearly, this was sloppy. Second, according to Kerner, one should endeavor to always present unvarnished data. Just the facts, ma'am. Nothing else. Why? So that the reader can judge for herself whether the analysis was sound, can in fact do the analysis for herself as a sanity check to what is actually reported by the investigator. Three, there are sometimes good and necessary reasons to massage data, to process it. For example, there might be known cases of outliers way out there, which distort the rest of the data. Those are experimental aberrations. And so it might make all kinds of sense to eliminate, issue, cut out, expurgate these stray extraneous observations. But if that is done, or if the data are massaged in any other way, then it is incumbent upon the investigator to provide details of what is done explain the mechanism and present this side by side with the original data so that again the reader can make up her own mind as to whether the process the mechanism of massaging the data was sound whether this was appropriate and finally Kerner suggests an aphorism which here also Riley points out is perhaps beyond the moral strength of most of us, and which is, to wit, do not conceal the weaknesses of your own arguments, and do not ignore strong points of opposing points of view. I will get to the analysis very, very briefly, but I can't resist, as Kerner did, with a very small historical digression. Right. Kerner points out that one reason that Darwin was so persuasive is that a reading of the origin of species brings to the fore a quite remarkable, transparent honesty. It is very rare that a scientist goes out of his way, almost, to point out weaknesses in his theory. This is a man who collected data over his life. And this was his life work, The Origin of Species. And in a reading of it, you find that he points out difficulties with the theory, places where the theory can break. For example, the theory of evolution requires extraordinarily long timescales of the order of hundreds, actually, thousands of millions of years, billions of years. But this ran counter to a historical tradition which had imagined that the Earth was very young in historical terms, a few thousand years. More blows were dealt to Darwin's theory, even from science, from thermodynamics, early calculations based on a, an inert cooling body due to, to Lord Kelvin, suggested the Earth was perhaps no more than 100 million years, or in a refinement of the calculation, perhaps no more than 50 million years old. And Darwin pointed out that was much too little for his theory. He was willing to almost abandon the theory if that were true. You just imagine the, the intestinal fortitude, the honesty required to be able to walk away from a life's work at need. Okay. And other areas where the theory had potential holes was 
that a hereditary mechanism was presupposed based upon the data that organisms passed on features to their progeny. But Darwin had no clue what the mechanism was. He posited the existence of a mysterious mechanism without knowing what it could be. And in many ways, as the century progressed on into the 20th century and beyond, and more and more data were accumulated, and more and more of these questions that Darwin raised were answered. The age of the Earth was answered by the discovery of radioactive emission, a new source of energy which pushed back the age of the Earth, back to between four and five billion years, more than enough for Darwinian evolution. The discovery that hereditary mechanisms were encoded in our genetic structure came much later, and all of these lent triumphant validation to this most glorious of theories. There is perhaps no other scientific theory which has had so much experimental validation. Here is an autobiographical quote from Darwin that I cannot resist giving you. And I'm going to read it to you. He said, I had during many years followed a golden rule, namely that whenever a published fact, a new observation or thought came across me, which was opposed to my general results. To make a memorandum of it without fail and at once. For I had found by experience that such facts and thoughts were far more apt to escape from memory than favorable ones. And it is perhaps this transparency of thought, this transparent honesty, which has ultimately led to such a strong persuasive acceptance of the Darwinian theories of natural selection. But we are digressing. Right. Let's go back to the question of Cyril Bat, and now let's take a look at the data. Yes, they were sloppily presented, but that does not mean that fraud was committed. Let us see what mathematics can tell us on the score. 